welcome everybody to the coaching manual webinar. Um, this is the first time we're going out on YouTube live as well. Um, I'm really pleased to invite two fantastic coaches um, onto, onto today's webinar. Um, before I do introduce both coaches, just want to say as always, uh, the webinar will be recorded and we will put the webinar onto the coachingmanual.com. Um, We've already received um, a huge volume of questions, which I've I've tried to uh, build into to the webinar as well. However, if we don't get around to answering your questions, um, I'm sure we can di direct them to Tracy and Carrie at a later date, um, and they'd be happy to pick some of those up. So, uh, without further ado, um, I want to introduce both of our guests. So, first off. Um, I'm going to introduce Tracy Ham. So Tracy um, holds the USSFB license and the prestigious UEFA A license um, that she completed recently with the FAW in Wales. She's a former professional player with Atlanta Beat and she's held positions as technical director at Heritage Soccer Club, as the head women's soccer coach at San Francisco State. And currently, Tracy is the head women's soccer coach at University of California, Davis. So that's Tracy. On to our second guest, Carrie Taylor. So Carrie holds the USSF A license and the NSCAA or now USC Director of Coaching Certificate. Carrie has held the positions of head soccer coach for both the men's and women's programs at Mount St. Joseph University in the NCAA, um, being one of only five women who have coached an NCAA men's soccer team. Um, she's held the position of director of coaching at United Football Club and Laguna United um, in Southern California, has been the assistant women's head coach at Vancouver Whitecaps, and Carrie is currently the assistant coach for the USL Club San Diego Royal, and as a result, Carrie is currently the only female coach of a professional men's soccer team in the United States. So two fantastic coaches and Tracy and Carrie, thank you so much for joining us today. Happy yes. to be here. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having us on. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I would say I'm privileged to, to know both, both coaches, both Carrie and Tracy. Um, personally and professionally, and, and it's going to be a fantastic webinar to tap into your insight and to your knowledge. So, um, without any further ado, we'll, we'll get started, and um, we've got a host of questions. We might not get through them all. There's been so much interest, but um, I will target the questions to you guys if that's okay. Um, first off, um, Tracy, we'll start with you. This is okay, and then we'll ask Carrie the same question. But Tracy. Obviously, soccer is such a popular sport in the USA. Um, how did you get involved with, with the sport and how did you develop your passion for the game, Tracy? Um, I think I probably started like most American girls. Your parents just throw you in the sport. I mean, they throw you in like every single sport and then the one that you like, you stick with. Um, I actually played five sports in high school and so I just happened to like soccer the most I, I like contact sports and so um I ended up just sticking with that and happened to be fairly decent at it so um I I played at Cal which was like the best four years I've ever had playing just you know personally and just getting to play with you know such phenomenal players and um you know I had a great staff when I was there um, and I think the, the female, I had a female assistant coach that just had so much passion for the game, um, passion for the school, a lot of traditions. And, um, it just kind of made me actually like consider it as a career. But, um, I think kind of after, after I was done playing in college, there wasn't a pro league yet. And, you know, you just kind of find ways to stay in the game and on the women's side, you really, really have to love it and be passionate about it to, um, you know, to kind of continue having it in your life. So I was driving like a few hours, like every weekend and a couple of days a week to go train with the team um, up in Sacramento. And um, again, like when you're, when you're that dedicated and you're finding all these other people that love the sport as much as you do, you can't help but like stay passionate and stay engaged. 
Um, and then, you know, I, I got my master's degree from Boston University in sports psychology and kind of thought that that was going to be my path. I want to be a sports psychologist. I felt like I had a really good grasp on the game, um, like the mental side of the game. Um, but once I was going through all like the clinical kind of work for that, I fairly quickly realized that I missed being on the field. Um, and I felt like I was going to be much more uh, influential as a coach than, um, you know, sitting in a room talking about feelings. <laughs> so, uh, once I, once I was done with my degree, I just couldn't wait to get started again and get back on the field. And I just realized how big of a, um, an impact the game it had on me and how much I wanted to impact other people, um, you know, and give them that same experience and that same passion and zest for the game that I had. Fantastic. Um, and we'll, we'll touch base on some of the things you mentioned because of obviously that documentary that, that we'll, we'll get into as well because because I was uh, privileged to watch that last night, got have a sneak preview. So Carrie, again, if you if you want to introduce to obviously the, the candidates, um, sorry, the, the attendees, your background and how you got involved in, in the game of soccer and where your passion developed. Um, yeah, thank you for asking. Um, it, I never used to even like soccer. <laughs> I, I literally started playing when um, one of the, one of my best friends was like, hey, we need some more players. So I jumped in a station wagon and went out to the field and played and, and loved it. Um, but I, I got involved in coaching um, through my hometown. We had like a summer sports program, at, which I would play in, and then they needed some coaches. So I started coaching when I was 15. And, you know, going into college, um, I played at the University of Michigan. And Back then, um, women's soccer was still growing. There were only very few Division I um, varsity soccer programs. So I went in, and our team was club. Um, and then my fifth year of school, we got upgraded to varsity. So we had like taken the time to have to hire our own coaches and schedule our own games and fundraise our own money. So I, was, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was actually kind of coaching and doing all the bits and pieces and all the admin stuff while I was in college. Yep. Um, and, you know, I'd always been encouraged by mentors to start getting your coaching licenses, you know, while you were in college and, and everything. So <clears throat> I did that. And then probably the moment that I realized I really wanted to coach was um, my, my fifth year of school, we had a night practice and I just had this feeling of like, wow, this is a lot of fun and, you know, this is my passion. So I remember I went on a really long walk one day and when I got back from the walk, I called my dad and said, dad, I'm not going to medical school. I'm going to be a soccer coach. And That's a big I spent thing. a greater part of my life trying to prove uh, that to my dad that soccer is, soccer coaching is a career. And, you know, I've been fortunate to work in a lot of different environments and have a lot of good mentors along the way. Um, and I just, you know, have really enjoyed um, the coaching. There's ups and downs. And, you know, a couple of years ago, I thought I was out of the game. And, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful uh, for the opportunity that I have now. And it's, it's you know, soccer is the, the universal sport. It's the universal language. And, you know, I'm biased, but I think it's the best sport in the world. And it unites communities and people and countries. And so, um, yeah, I wouldn't wouldn't have had it any other way, even though it hasn't been all that easy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like you say, always ups and downs, and you know, straight away we can tell uh, from from both Carrie and Tracy both both your passions and getting back on the soccer path, having opportunities in the medical professions and psychology professions, um, and it is a sport as, as you both rightly said that sticks with you and gets under your skin. So. Um, Carrie, in terms of your coaching philosophy then, um, how have those experiences up until this point um, shaped your own coaching philosophy and methodology and, and what do you perceive as your core values when you're coaching players within the game? Um, good question. Um, I think, you know, as a coach, sometimes your philosophy changes as you get older and you have more experience and... Um, also dependent on the level that you're coaching. Um, but I think, you know, the, you mentioned the core values. So like we have core values within our team of, you know, respect, gratitude, competition, and compassion. And, you know, 
not everyone's going to be great at all of those things, but when we, when we make decisions or when things are, are going good and bad, we try to look back to those core values. Um, what one core value that's like inherent within me is, is just hard work. And that's something that, you know, you don't always have to be the most talented person or player, but you can control your effort and your, your work ethic. And that's something that I think I got from like where I grew up in the environment that I grew up in. So that's something that, you know, I can control that. And so that's just something that, that, I, you know, hopefully I can impart that on the, the people, the men and women, girls and boys that I've coached along the way is, you know, hard work does pay off in the long run. And so that's, that's, uh, you know, one of my big core values. Fantastic. And, and one of the things what resonated with, with myself, and I hope you don't mind me saying this, Carrie, was when I came down to, to watch uh, you deliver with, with the new USL uh, Club San Diego Loyal and, and the Bricks. Um, oh, yeah, you were there for the Brick. I thought that was fantastic. Yeah, I mean, you have to build in any program and any, you know, Tracy just took over a new college program and she and I talked offline about you know, building a culture and building things and having a steady foundation. And, you know, that's, that's key to any program, what, whether you're coaching youth, whether you're coaching, you know, high school, whether you're coaching college professional is, is having some foundations that you always can turn to and, and, you know, use as a guidepost, I guess. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, Tracy, obviously uh, on the same vein, and, and I know you've had a lot of uh, experiences even recently since, since we met a number of years ago on, on the USSFB license so how has your coaching philosophy Tracy developed as a result of those experiences and and what 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 do you value within the game? Yeah definitely um, I think that the coaching philosophy is an you know ever-evolving um, you know kind of entity and for me, I think when I first started coaching, um, you know, you when you're coming from a, a playing background to now being a coach, it's a much different role. Um, as much as a lot of times you don't want to accept that you're not playing anymore, it's still I still have I still battle with that. Um, but I think when I first started coaching, you know, it's like I I always just was like, let's just crush. Like everything is like 100% full effort. Let's go. Let's dominate. Um, you know, and depending on what role you're on or like where you're in um, you're at in your coaching career. Uh, I think just like with maturity and kind of understanding people, you know, the biggest takeaways that your players are going to have is like how you made them feel about something or what kind of belief system you imparted. Um, you know, X's and O's and the tactics of the game are so fun. Right. And that's what coaches love. And we wish we had to only do that part, but the main part of the role, um, is really, you know, working with an age demographic and there it's malleable right so for me i'm coaching college and these are you know really important years of changing you know life trajectories 18 to 22 year olds trying to figure out who they are in the world where they're going to go um so for me i really use soccer as like a medium um in terms of like coaching like life lessons so one of our biggest values that we have here um that i've kind of had at every program because for me it's a huge personal value is is showing merit um and showing value. So whether you're the most technical player, whether you're the most tactical player, or, you know, you're the best in the air, or maybe you're the best player on the bench in terms of, um, you know, leading and managing people's personalities and disappointments. Like as long as you show merit in something that you have value to the program or the team, um, we talk about that a lot. Um, and for me, like my game philosophy and my coaching philosophy is, you know, you lead by example, um, and I definitely agree with Carrie, you know, attitude and effort are everything because those are really controllable things. There's a lot other, you know, a lot of other items and, you know, other qualities that, you know, you would want of a fantastic player, fantastic team. But at the end of the day, it's effort and attitude, um, you know, and again, that comes back to merit. Where's your value? What are you, what are you imparting on your teammates um, to help them be successful? Um, but really from a soccer perspective, is recognizing where's your team at um, in their development, uh, you know, and obviously the the timeline for pro seasons is different than the timeline for club seasons, different than college season. Um, so really adapting your philosophy based on um, the level, 
the qualities that you have from individuals and then just kind of the overall culture that you've created and where are you in that process also. So being a new coach with a new team, um, we're just now starting to build that culture. But if you've been at a program for 10 years, that culture should be set and you kind of already have those expectations and it's very team led. Right now, a lot of what we're working on is it's coach led, you know, and I'm, I'm hoping eventually we get to that point where I can really step back and have the team already know kind of what those expectations and standards are and then they continue to lead themselves. Fantastic. Um, obviously, both both of you are in, in not a rebuild, a, a build from the ground up, so to speak, um, and, and sp sticking on, on the theme of, you know, coaching philosophies and methodologies and structures. Um, I'll ask Carrie this question first. Carrie, you're, you're obviously working at a senior professional level um, now where you're going to be judged on wins and losses when we do finally get into the season at some point. Um, right. so how does how does your typical structure of a coaching session look like within that, that professional environment? Um, as far as like what's a, what's a day in the life? Or... Yeah, a day in the life in terms of what does that look like and, and what are the demands on yourself and your coaching staff? Yeah, so um, we have um, obviously our head coach, um, Landon Donovan, who needs no introduction. Um, Nate Miller is our other assistant coach who coached in League One and myself. And, you know, Nate takes um, a majority of the lead in kind of designing the practices, but we, we kind of look at, you know, well, our periodization is out the window completely right now <laughs> for the season because yeah. we have no idea when we're going to play again. But yeah. Um, you know, we, we have our, basically our team principles and what we wanted to get a, accomplished in our preseason. And we, you know, have our morning meetings and we go over what the training session is going to look like, who's going to take what, who's leading what, um, you know, we're all out there doing our bits and pieces. Sometimes we split up into, you know, attacking players and, um, you know, Nate will take the defenders and Landon and I take a group or I'll have a group by myself. So we try to tag team it as much as we can. Um, and, you know, in part like our training principles within the team and get buy-in from the team and evaluate, you know, where we're at and how we're doing. Um, and then a couple of days a week, they, they lift. Um, and we always like have a meeting at lunchtime of kind of debriefing, how'd it go? What do you think? Who's playing well? You know, always looking to see who who we think is going to be in that next lineup. Um, it's a real collaborative process on our on our staff. I know some head coaches do it differently, but um, Landon's a very collaborative leader, and you know, I'm learning. That's the one thing that Tracy and I also had a conversation um, about. Is you know, I asked her why she went and did her license overseas, and it's like sometimes you reach a point point in your career where if you're the head coach or you're the DOC, like you almost don't have anyone to learn from. So um, I think, you know, things like being on podcasts and listening to podcasts and learning from each other are super important because, you know, you never stop learning and this game keeps evolving and evolving and evolving. So um, yeah, learning every day. Brilliant. Uh, and that's an, actually a nice introduction into um, Tracy's, most recent experience with um, obviously going overseas and doing the prestigious UEFA license with the FAW and Tracy, for those who aren't aware, has, has been involved within a documentary um, around coaching and I'm not sure on the release date or, or where this, but Tracy will allude to that, but the interesting thing I pulled from, from uh, that documentary I was making notes throughout was uh, the UA4A license, obviously being the highest coaching award, because the pro license is a management award uh, in Europe. 43,803 UA4A license coaches um, have come through that system, uh, myself being one of them. 1% 1 are women, which blew me away. But even when I read that myself, I was fortunate to be on with a number of candidates, both females, males, from 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 across all different levels of the, of the game. But Tracy, in terms of completing that UA for A licence, how were those experiences? And again, there was some high profile ex-players on there, Peter Crouch, Mido. Uh, I think I saw Steve Sidwell and Robbie Earnshaw in there as well. Um, so 
how were those experiences? And obviously we all know how competitive the pro level can be. Um, and it can be dog eat dog, but how were you, how were you received as being an American coach in Wales from those established professional players? Yeah. Um, so luckily when I, when I first got to, to Wales, um, they, it was really intimidating, right? Cause you walk into the national training center and they just have like table, like round table set up with people's name tags. And I was one of the first people there, like per usual, and you make sure everything's dialed and I had no idea where I was going or even really why I was there, what I was, you know, I was terrified. So I show up and I'm like walking around the tables looking for my name tag. And of course I'm like recognizing some of these names in immediate like panic mode. Like why am I here? Like what have I done? Um, but it was really cool. And of course, like I'm noticing some of the names but I'm also noticing that there's like not one girl's name anywhere either. And so I'm already panicking. Okay. Um, but it was really, it was really amazing. The once everyone kind of filled in and everyone knew each other, cause you know, a lot of them were either from, you know, England or Wales or, you know, grown up playing each other. And, yeah. um, we had to go around the room and introduce ourselves. And of course I was like one of the last people. And I knew that people were like staring at my back for like an hour. Like, who's this girl? A, hey. you know? <laughs> and so I totally stand up and I'm like, hi, I'm Tracy. Like, of course, like the, like, bubbly like California I'm American like duh obviously you could tell um you know and so it was fun because it kind of broke the ice like right away like they were like laughing and you know I'm like I'm just like so excited to be here and this is amazing I can't wait um but it was actually really cool because over the course of that that first week um a lot of those players hadn't really coached yet right they're at the tail end of their careers or they hadn't really had a ton of experience and so I kind of quickly realized like when they were asking us to design training sessions and going over methodology that, you know, I, I knew a lot of what, what to do. Right. And so they were starting to ask me questions is, Hey, how would you run this session? If we had to do, you know, defending in the wide area, um, like what would you do? And I'm like, well, I will help you, you know? So I got more confidence kind of as I went on. Um, yeah. But you know what, it was really interesting because I really felt like there wasn't, for as many talented players and the experience in the room, there really wasn't any ego. And it was like, they were really there to learn. And it didn't feel like it was like a means to an end of like, I have to get this license so I can coach. It was like, there was like a very clear investment um, from these people and these individuals to, um, you know, that they, they wanted to learn, they wanted to get better. Um, so in that way, I felt like it was like super respectful. Um, I had, I mean, I had, had such a great experience that I couldn't wait to go back. So when they asked me to come back to do the UEFA, A, um, you know, I, I couldn't turn it down. Like I just wanted another opportunity because I learned so much from them. I learned so much from the instructors. Um, they think about the game in a very, very different way than I had been trained, um, you know, in the United States. And so, um, like I couldn't write fast enough, you know, it was like every single day my mind was blown. Um, so it was incredibly valuable and, um, I, I mean, very rewarding, uh, and, you know, made really great friends with, um, a lot of coaches and a lot of really, really cool people. So it was amazing. There, there was a comment that I touched on in the documentary and I hope you don't mind me asking. Uh, mm -hmm. it was, it was around, um, sometimes you feel that, that particularly male coaches explain rather than discuss the game in the presence of female coaches mm -hmm. um, and, and that as a result sometimes you have to over explain your your thought processes and your knowledge if you like um, just touch on that a bit in terms of you know how that process found out because obviously I've worked with you on, on courses and, and we've had some fantastic dialogues um, but how did that play out over the course of the of the UA for A do you think? Right. I think, you know, I'd say like for the majority of the candidates, it was like very respectful and it, there wasn't anything that was like disrespectful, but it, it's, it's interesting because I think this translates like not just to coaching, it's women really in like any environment, whether you're like in a corporate environment or really anything is like, you know, it, for women in particular, it's especially in soccer is like, you're always trying to like validate yourself, you know, because you feel like you, you, you have to, right? Like, there's not enough professional playing experience or you're judged on where you played in college or like, did you play pro? And so for me, like, I know that I'm in a very, very different boat. Like I, in a lot of circles, like I have instant valid, you know, validity because of my experiences. Most women don't have that. Um, and so they're trying extra hard to show, 
hey, I know I have a lot of experience. I might not have played at this level or I might not have done this, but I still know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And I think that there's just a lot of environments. Um, in my experience, you know, with a couple of people in Wales was, um, it wasn't, there wasn't any, it's not like malicious where they're trying to explain it to me. It's like, they just want to help but it's like patronizing without them knowing that. And so I think what, what the film kind of does is it highlights some of like the nuances that maybe men don't recognize that they're like talking to you in a certain way and they're not trying to be mean or like put you down or disrespectful. It's more like they want to help you along because they feel like you need it where you're like, I, I don't, thank you so much. But like, you know, and it's, it, if it was like collaborative and you can actually have a conversation about something. Um, and I know you're talking about, you know, when I'm, going through it, we're doing a match analysis with Chelsea and Man U, um, and the, the guy that I'm working with, you know, happens to look over and he's like, so this is the formation. Um, and you know, it's like, we've been watching for like an hour and I'm like, yeah, yeah. Like I got it. You know, we've, we've been doing this and, you know, as opposed to being like, Hey, why do you think that he's, they chose this formation or like, there's not like a dialogue. It's more like, let me help you through this. Um, you know, and, and that's fairly common, um, you know, so really, I think it's cool that you, you wanted to bring that up, because for all the women that are watching this, like, I see you, like, we know what happens, and it's kind of cool, because you can actually even acknowledge it, and be like, hey, like, bro, let's just, like, talk about this, instead of you, like, telling me about it. But, yeah, no, it's a, it, was a, it was a point I really picked up on, um, I appreciate you talking about that, and it links nicely into what I'm going to ask Carrie as well, because Carrie, you've coached both male and female players now at a senior level, um, college level, and in the pro game um, with, with um, San Diego Royal. What are the similarities and differences in, in coaching both genders? And do you think that you have to adapt your own coaching style as a result? Um, you know, the, it's a good question. I think there are some differences, um, but I think the older that I get, the more I realize that every individual is different so that you need to figure out, you know, what motivates player A versus player B, not necessarily Joe versus Jane. Um, I think that, you know, that's, that's kind of what I've come to after, after all the journey. And I think players nowadays have also changed as opposed to players 10, 15 years ago, as, as far as motivation and different things like that. So the psychology has evolved, as has the coaching, as has, you know, the technical ability of the players and the tactical structures within the game. So again, it's always that, that learning process. Um, I do want to, I do want to touch on something Tracy just said, though, as far as about um, women proving themselves or trying to, you know, have to explain I think it's it's not a knock on men it's more of an unconscious bias that maybe you know it when you're around a majority of men all the time and you know there's a woman in the room it's kind of like sometimes they're not sure how to act or are sure like our knowledge level but once you prove yourself as a woman then and you earn the respect then it's kind of done like at least that's been my kind of circumstances and, and experiences. So as far as the difference be between coaching female and male players, the guys, you kind of have to earn the respect. But again, like once, once it happens, it's done. Whereas the women, they have to know that you care about them first and then they kind of like buy into it. They don't care about your knowledge. They want to know a little bit more that like you really care about them as a person. Yeah, I think it's a really good point you made, Carrie, about everyone's an individual we're coaching individuals here within within teams and squads um but know the individual and and i think that's a really relevant point um so obviously carrie I'll, I'll stick with you for the time being within the usa obviously there's been a recent push for strong female role models in in soccer obviously cindy Powell has just um whether it be temporary or not but the presidential role within the u.s soccer federation um, U.S. Women's National Team leading the way off, you know, on on and off the field um, with with Jill Ellis as coach, and and I consider both yourself and Tracy as strong female role models in the game as well. Hence why we invited you on. Um, but why do you think it has taken until 2020 or, or the last few years 
for this to happen in the USA when women's soccer has been huge in the US for, you know, it's been a global leader for 30 years. Why is it taken to this point, do you think? Um, very good question. And I, I've been reading a lot now in this downtime coronavirus. Um, and I just finished a good book um, called Untamed. And it talks about like our culture in general and how, you know, boys and men are supposed to behave within these constructs and women and girls are supposed to behave within these different constructs. And, um, you know, this is just my opinion, but sport usually is behind business and politics and different things like that. So I think that we're just now catching up with, you know, the quote unquote strong female role models. I mean, Tracy's a coach. I'm a coach. Leslie Gallimore's a coach. Jill Ellis is a coach, you know, like that gender, shouldn't really matter it shouldn't be like oh there's a good female coach because you don't really say that about you know we don't go oh landon donovan's a good male coach or paul bright's a good male coach so you know it's it's trying to um just catch up with and break through some of the cultural societal constructs a little bit and you know we just have to keep riding you know going up the hill and sliding back a little and going up the hill and sliding back a little until we get over the top yeah so no really good points and i couldn't agree more about you're a good coach you're a good coach um tracy similar question to you as well do you think female coaches have a more difficult path to to hiring promotions and opportunities than male counterparts and again I touched on something that appeared in your documentary around 940 colleges had women's soccer teams, only a third of which were coached by women, mm-hmm. which seems, you know, is, is there something amiss here? I, I don't have the answers, <laughs> so I'm not yeah. sure. So. Yeah, I think um, it, it's definitely a different pathway. Um, and, and it's different for everybody. It's not, you know, coaching soccer in general, like there isn't, unfortunately, like if you do this and then you do this, then this happens. Um, everybody has a different path. And a lot of it's unfortunately like kind of based on who you know, rather than what you know. A lot of people get their first opportunities, you know, because they played for a coach and they know them. Or um, I think what's happening a lot right now in the college game is, you know, all the male head coaches are like, oh, I should have a female. Like that's what the expectation is now. So they're hiring assistant female coaches. And I think that that's actually going to change because once, I mean, this in a nice way, like once all those older coaches that have been there for a long time age out, you're going to have a really big wave of female coaches that have been assistants for a long time that are going to be able to step into those roles. So I do think that there's change that's coming at that level, which is great. Uh, It's just going to take time. Um, But I think what's, interesting um and this is kind of that goes along with what carrie said is i think that you know there hasn't been change at the um at the increase that we would want like as quickly as possible um because i think for a long time like there just there aren't that many opportunities for women and when you're you don't want to question why something is happening like you don't want to rock the boat so you're never like you know, I think like a lot of the women, the, the deal with like the lawsuit and stuff is, you know, they, they signed that contract, right? So it's kind of on them in some ways, but they also didn't want to not sign because then they don't get that opportunity. Like you're kind of forced into like making decisions, whether or not you agree with them or not, because you don't want to rock the boat. You don't want to lose out on an opportunity because you didn't take it you know, um, because you like questioned, you know, well, I deserve more than this, or this isn't fair. Like you just, you accept it because you didn't want to lose it at that time. And I think what's happening now, especially with how vocal the national team has been is like, that's changing where now you can kind of voice like, this isn't fair. Like we should be getting more or whatever. Um, but there's something like Abby Wambach said, um, you know, I can't remember if it's like in her book or one of her speeches, but she was like, women are really thankful for the opportunity always. And they don't, you know, like, then that's it. They're not like, cool, let me take advantage of this. Like, it's just like, oh, thank you so much. It's like, well, yeah, you're appreciative, but we're not like necessarily creating those opportunities for ourselves and taking advantage of them. Um, 
But I think what's also going to change is there's a lot of women that are now, you know, and men too, which is the best part because we need your help, you know, is bringing, bringing along women like with them, like, okay, like I made it. Now you reach back and you take the next person with you. Um, so in that way, I think it's changing quite a bit. Um, but the pathway is, it is what it is, you know, right now. And you just got to have some thick skin and get through it, you know? So, um, rely on the people around you, create a really strong social, you know, network um around people that you trust that are going to help you get to that next level because that's kind of all um that you can depend on and, and keep pushing yourself to learn more and get better and be uncomfortable you've got to put yourself in uncomfortable situations brilliant i'd, I'd, I'd touch base on obviously both of you had touched on it but recognizing good coaches and, and i love that comment trace about reaching back because you know it's important that we find the best coaches at the at the top level. Ultimately, soccer is always going to be a glamorous game to be involved in. Everyone wants to be involved with it, but we've got to recognise the top top coaches. Simple as that, uh, and provide opportunity. So, fantastic. I'm going to ask a couple of questions. What are coming in from from the audience? Because my chat bar is blowing up, and some really good debate. Um, one from Corey Johnson here, and Trace. I'll ask you first, but. Being as women's football is bigger than men's football in the USA, what do you think are the benefits or downfalls of being a coach in women's football compared to different parts of the world where men's football is more popular? And we can flip this on to carry as well afterwards, looking in the, in the men's game. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that we obviously, like, for as little, you know, as I'm kind of knocking the opportunities that women have here, like, we obviously have profoundly more opportunities in the United States to coach, um, you know, than, than abroad. Um, and I, I mean, it, it's, it's hard to, well, I'll tell you this, like, I'm actually really excited and it's been really kind of inspiring to see the response of, you know, European countries invest in not just their pro leagues on the women's side, but really invest on their international teams. Um, I think they're, you know, and I know that FIFA obviously has also, um, you know, said that they're going to come and they're going to put more funding into the women's game, which is also really important. Um, but, I, you know, I have like a big dream, right, of being this American female coach to go coach professionally, you know, in Europe and, um, you know, on the women's side or the men's, like, well, I don't know, we'll see. But like, um, you know, right now, women's soccer in the United States, like you, you can make a shit ton of money, like you really can, and, you know, and as much as like, we're not making a lot of like, we're not in the tech industry, we don't work for Google, but like, you know, like we can survive, you can make, you make a good living here, coaching girls soccer. And I know that that's 100% not true, which is, you know, um, you know, abroad. And so I hope that that changes. Because um, obviously, I think that there's a lot of not just uh, female coaches, but male coaches that are fantastic that have to get out of the game because, um, you know, they have families and they can't afford to live on the salaries that they're making. Sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, at, at, there, there's so many opportunities for women to stay in the game, whether it's coaching or not um, here, because, you know, we have a, a pro league for men and for women, there's just not, not as many, but yeah. No, great. Well, Tracy, before I move on to Carrie, would you would it be part of your ambition to coach in the men's game, or or is it? You know, do you see yourself developing towards that that ambition of the, the U.S. women's national team, or you know, what, where do your ambitions and, and your future pathway lie? Do you think? Yeah, um, I think for me, I I just continue to like move forward and like whatever opportunities arise, like I just want to always make sure that I'm prepared for them. Um, yeah. And so I would love, I mean, I'd, I'd love to coach an international team. Like I'd love to coach the U S but I'd also a hundred percent be open to coaching, you know, another country. Um, and on the men's side, um, I think right now I just feel like I really like coaching um, this particular like age range of women. Um, you know, and I think being, like you said, like, there's just, there's not a lot of, like, female coaches that are role models that, are, you know, are in this profession right now. Um, but I, I, like, I love the college game. I love working at a university and kind of, like, what this environment is like. And I'm sure I'll age out of that. I'm sure I'll burn out of that, you know. <laughs> we'll see where it goes. But, I mean, for me, like, nothing's off the table. Like, I'd love to coach boys. I think I'd love to coach men. Um, I just love the game and I love coaching. So, wherever I feel like I can make the biggest impact, wherever I am, you know, in my career or where I am in like my, you know, my personal life and my growth, 
Um, I might, I'm someone that always likes new challenges. So there might be one day where I'm like, I got to do something different. Cool. Let's help with the men's side, you know, and kind of pursue that. So we'll see. Right. Uh, and, and flipping over to Carrie as someone who has, you know, the f pioneer really, the first, um, you know, and only current woman to coach within the professional men's game in the United States. Question might be why and, and what's the driver behind that? Um, if you would have asked me like even five years ago, would I envision myself in this position? I, I would have said no. Um, when I, when I coached my college men's team, it was more about the challenge and, and the opportunity. Um, and so I took it and that was back in 2005. And, you know, I stayed quietly under the radar and I, there wasn't a big, there was no, like no one really knew about it other than the people that I played against and, and things like that. Um, you know, I'm, I am grateful for the opportunity, but you know, the, the challenge is making sure, making sure to fulfill my role as a coach first and not, not necessarily be worried about like, oh, like I need to do all this for female coaches. Like I have a job to do and I need to focus on that first and foremost, but I also don't want to be the only one, you know, three years from now or, you know, knock on wood, I still have my job three years from now, <laughs> but <laughs> coaches get hired to get fired. But, you yeah. know, I, I want younger coaches to, to, see me and see Tracy and, and see Jill Ellis and, you know, um, aspire, want to aspire to, to, to be in these roles. Um, because, you know, women can do it. The game is the same. It's soccer. Like men's soccer is a little faster than women's soccer. Women might be a little bit more actually tactical and not, you know, a little less physical, yeah. but it's, it's the same game. And, you know, our brains are the same. We can analyze things similarly. So, you know, the, the hope is, my hope is that other head coaches within the men's game see what Landon's done and said, hey, let's open up the, the pool of applicants and hire quality people. So, you know, if he's willing to take a risk or open the door for me, hopefully there's other, other people out there in, in the positions to hire that will look at women and will look at, you know, other races and genders and ethnicities and, and just, you know, make it what it is on the, on the playing side, which is multicultural and also on the coaching side. Cause I think that's the one thing within soccer is we need to do a better job of. Brilliant. Um, so touching on, and then we'll probably get to some more of the questions that so many coming in. Uh, thank you everyone. Um, so the Women's World Cup final in 2019 obviously saw two female coaches lead the teams to the final. Jill Ellis, who, again, fantastic tr track record, and uh, Serena Wyman from the Netherlands. Yet the majority of head coaches were still male within in the World Cup. Carrie, do you see a shift towards the female coaches in the future? And also, obviously, you've got coaches like Inka Grings now in Germany working yeah. in the men's professional game and, you know, how, how far are we away from seeing a female coach lead out a men's international team at a World, World Cup? You know, can, will this happen? Yeah, I mean, in my humble opinion, I think it will. And, you know, just looking at the growth of the game, like, like I said, 25 years ago, it, when I was back in college, there were two Division I Big Ten women's programs. And in 25 years, you know, the number of, college programs in the U.S. has exploded. So now, now there's, you know, generations of players who have come through, have done their coaching licenses, who are now on, you know, the roller coaster of a pathway to get into coaching. So it's only a matter of time before that growth of the past 25 years gets to 30 and 35 years. And, you know, people, um, women are seen in you know, those higher positions all across the world, hopefully, you know, as Tracy mentioned, the U.S. has usually always been at the forefront within the women's game. And now other countries are, you know, breaking through their own cultural barriers and putting women 
um, in in those positions and and you know putting them in leadership roles and um, yeah I mean my my hope is ten years from now we it's an all women's you know coaching staff at the women's World Cup and there's it's not a big deal for women to be coaching men or women to be you know, in, in these higher positions or being presidents of clubs or general managers of clubs. So um, we'll, we'll get there. It, it'll take time. We're, we, we just, you know, got a late start. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, great advice again and, and great insight. Tracy, i um, going to get back on to the theme of coaching for the final 10-15 with, with Tracy and Carrie. So um, Tracy, I'll ask you this first and then we'll go back to Carrie. Um, what advice would you give to young coaches who want to pursue a career in the game? Because obviously, both both yourself and Carrie have, have turned turned down opportunities to pursue other professions for a career in the game. What's what's the best piece of advice or, or bits of advice you can give for coaches, young coaches who want to pursue a career in the game? Mm. Well, I think the first thing, and I kind of touched on this earlier, is that everyone's going to have a different path. And so you can't really look at other people and judge the way that they got somewhere because you really don't know the whole story. And you just really kind of need to worry about yourself and your own development and like the success and the opportunities will come with that. Um, but you know, it's really similar. Like when you're recruiting a kid and they say, well, I, you know, I should be going, if this person's going to that school, I should be going to that school or whatever it is. Like the comparison doesn't, ever work because you never know what coaches are necessarily looking for, or like what the deal is or how it's set up. And so when you're going through the coaching, you know, kind of pathway and pursuing the career, like don't judge it based on what other people have done, um, you know, because it's never going to be the same. Um, and also just acknowledge like you're, <laughs> you're not going to know everything. And I think in particular for young female coaches, a lot of women don't pursue it because, um, you know, there's a, there's a variety of reasons, but one of the main things is like, they're, they're in an environment where they're, you know, they, they don't feel like they're the best at it or the greatest and they don't know everything yet. And it's like, you, you can't expect that of yourself when you're 23, 24 years old, like you're not going to know everything. Like, you know, I've been doing this 15 years and if I ever think that I know everything, then I need to get out of it, you know? And so like, I hope I continue to develop and grow. Um, but don't, you know, you're going to have to have thick skin. You're going to have to recognize that there's going to be people that have more experience, that have more knowledge and like to be open for that, be open to feedback, um, you know, and to educate yourself. I mean, that's one of like the, the main things, like I just, I, you know, at San Francisco state and at UC Davis, I got, um, you know, wrote a bunch of emails and kind of, we got it figured out where us soccer actually paid for, you know, my 25 players at SF State and 25 players at UC Davis, all the girls to get their U.S. grassroots license. So, I mean, you know, I didn't make it an optional thing. I was like, hey, guess what you guys are doing on Sunday? We're going to use car hours and we're going to get our licenses, you know, and you just put them on a path. And so now you've got, you know, 50 young women that all have their grassroots license that now moving forward, they can get their D. And by the time, you know, they're in their mid-20s, like maybe they realize that they, they love it, you know, and they want to stick with it. But um, start your licenses now, you know, um, but really, you know, cast a wide net, be open to moving. You're going to move all over probably. And you're going to, you know, work a lot because most of the time you got to work an extra job and just, you know, it's all for the love of the game. It's for the love of what you're doing. And if you have that, you'll find a way to survive it and pursue it. Um, and you'll make it work. So, um, you know, that's my advice. How, you touched on formal coach education quite a lot. How important is that, Tracy, in terms of getting those coaching licenses for, for all coaches out there? Do you place a big emphasis on that yourself? Um, I do in some ways, only because it's like a requirement for most club teams, like DA and all that stuff, to move through the DA or even to coach in like the NPL or like any league. You know, there's like a basic requirement. So you might as well start it now, otherwise you can't even coach at all. Um, now pursuing like the higher licenses, obviously that's like a massive financial investment and, you know, hopefully you've got clubs that will help pay for that. Um, you know, so it's not coming out of pocket. Um, but I think, you know, it's not, uh, Carrie, Carrie said this earlier cause we talked about it, right. Is like, it's not necessarily something that's like required or like essential to your development, but at some point, like you want to hear what other people are doing and you want to continue, like there's no bad knowledge. 
right? And so a lot of the licensing, you know, are opportunities for you to learn from other people. And you might only take away one thing. I mean, there's some licenses where I watched one practice out of 50 and was like, hell yeah, that was the best practice, you know, and like there's little takeaways and that's valuable to me. Like, why not, you know? And so just putting yourself in uncomfortable situations and, you know, you might be exposed, but you know, you're going to, you're going to grow from that. And so it's okay. But the, the licenses are, it, it's just more information, you know, it's just more tools in your toolkit. Um, it might not be essential, but it's certainly valuable if you can, um, accept the information and, you know, try to try to find something valuable in it. Right. Um, Carrie, I'll ask you the same question. Um, and I, and I was chuckling to myself when, uh, Tracy talked about moving around. <laughs> so oh, yeah. um, moving around. You've got, yeah. yeah. I think what I'd advice would you give? What advice would you give to young coaches then who are walking to pursue? Yeah. Career? So I was taking notes and jotting things down while Tracy was, was talking. Um, I think, a couple of key things that you know if I were to look back on on what I feel is important for people to know is if if coaching whether it's soccer or hockey or football or whatever if it's your passion like go like go for it I mean life's too short not to follow your passion like if I went to medical school I never would have been happy I probably would have jumped dropped out so like first and foremost like follow your passion um the second thing I would say is you're going to fail. So like, don't, don't be afraid of, of failure. You know, I, not a ton of people know this, but I went from working for the Vancouver Whitecaps to being out of a job and unloading boxes for UPS. And like that moment of failure was actually, you know, something that I had to use my, my soccer coaching and my soccer playing background to get out of and get onto that next job. So, you know, don't, don't be sidetracked by, a, by a little bit of failure. Um, a couple other things like find good mentors along the way. I always had um, people that I could go to that were looking out for me that would give good, honest advice and sometimes like check me when I needed to be checked. And so good mentorship is really important. Um, yeah. And then, you know, within your coaching, you're going to develop your own personality. So like, you can't step out there and be someone that you're not, you can't like take a session or go watch someone else and go, I'm going to replicate this. Like you have to be confident enough to be you and whoever that you is, that's okay. So, you know, make sure that along your, your route, you come in and grow into who you are as a coach and and be okay with, with being yourself. Um, and then the final thing I'll, you know, that kind of puts it all back together is you're going to work, you're going to have to work hard. Like a lot of people see coaching as the shiny glitz and glamor thing. And it's not all glitz and glamor. Like it's a lot of freaking hard work. So, and that, that doesn't change at the different levels to be completely honest, like that, that hard work and, you know, there's some times you're going to be like, I can't believe I'm really doing this, but like, Hey, it's all for the team. So you're like, you just have to get it done. So that's what I would say. Fantastic. Um, final question from myself and Carrie, I'll, I'll start with you here. Um, what do you believe the future game looks like in regards to, to playing styles and, and philosophy on the field? And, you know, how, how do you think you'll prepare your players for, for the future game and what's to come? Oh gosh, that's a tough question <laughs> because like, I would, I mean, uh, I mean, I think right now we're in kind of a phase where it's, you know, it's soccer's really dynamic and there's all sorts of different formations and that's evolved, you know, like I remember the first time I played soccer that was like a sweeper, you know, and like you only played a couple positions and coaches only knew a couple formations. So I think, you know, I think the growth of the game is more is hopefully less organization and back to some more creativity and and more flow within the game um and you know the players are only going to continue to to evolve and be more technical and more tactical as the coaches evolve with the game and more people are playing and um you know with different philosophies and ideas and um, about the game. So I, I think, you know, like I said, in the past 30 years, that 30 some odd, I can't do the math, years that I've 
been involved with the game, it, it's really grown. And, you know, 30 years from now when I'm, when I'm gone, um, or maybe when I'm, you know, I'm like, on my there. motor scooter or something, I don't know. I mean, I'm old, I'm 47. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I hope that it truly becomes like the number one game in the U.S. And I think it's on its trajectory to do that. And that it's open and available to all so that it, you know, it shouldn't be dictated on how much money your family has. It should be a game that everyone can be a part of and everyone can excel in. Um, and, and that it's, you know, that the U.S. women's team continues to win and hopefully the men's team qualifies for the next World Cup. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Tracy, I'll ask you the same question. Thanks for that, Carrie. Um, in terms of what, what does the future game look like um, in regards to playing styles for yourself and, and how are you going to impart your knowledge uh, onto your players in preparation for this? Um, I think this is like specific to the women's game. Um, you know, but historically the United States and like American players are just like so dominant athletic athletes. And that's a lot of the way that they had the success that they did early on um, is that they're just more athletic and there's more, you know, more to choose from. Um, but I think what we saw in the last World Cup, um, you know, in particular with like Spain and, you know, in Japan is that there's definitely more of a shift towards being, you know, cleaner on the ball and having more, um, more of an emphasis on technique. And like Carrie said, like more creativity, you know, some of the most fun players to watch are the most technical ones, you know, like, you know, Tobin and Megan Rapino and, you know, Rose Lavelle, like every, like everyone was obsessed with Rose Lavelle after the last World Cup because she was so unique in comparison to a lot of what the other players looked like, you know, not internationally. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, Spain, like that was such a fun game and, even their recent matchups, you know, in the She Believes Cup were really fun games to watch. Um, and it was definitely more of a shift away from just, you know, crush and run and long balls and just outrun people and, and beast people. So um, I'm more excited about that part, you know, and I think actually the FIFA rule changes are going to change quite a bit of that also, like being able to build out of the back and play shorter and smaller. Um, you know, and so for me, like coaching at the, you know, at the college level um, with older players, you know, my hope is that club coaches are watching that and the players that are working in the youth development recognize like what the shift where it's going so that they can help develop those players prepare for them to play more of a you know um keep keep the ball on the ground a little bit more um play kind of like a more a more clean game um but for me i mean it, it's a competition and athletes win athletic contests and i will never forget that quote as long as i live because you've got to you know you've got to adapt and you've got to make changes and be flexible about your approach um, and there's a lot of, you know, disparity, um, at every level internationally, like, you know, you look at us and you look at Thailand and there's different tactics and things that are going to be required for you to win games, the college level. I mean, Stanford's unbelievable, you know, and there's a huge range of different teams. And so you've got to find a way to win. It's a competition. Um, but the game in particular, I think it's, it's getting, it's getting a lot more technical. It's getting a lot more tactically driven. Coaches are definitely preparing themselves um, to be more strategic about their approach um, and more invested in their education and their their development. So um, it's been it's been a fun change. I feel like um, I've I'm kind of I, and I don't want to say like coming into my own, but really embracing where I'm at in my coaching journey. And I feel like it's fun because I I grew up playing in the very like athlete driven um, kind of environment to now watching it develop and developing with that as a, as a you know as a coach and shifting away from that and, um, you know, pursuing more of a, the nice game, you know, beautiful game. So, uh, it's, it's been fun. Brilliant. Um, so that, that's time for, for the webinar. And I just want to say a massive thank you to all of the attendees and of course to Carrie Taylor and to, to Tracy Ham. So, uh, Tracy, if, um, attendees and coaches, want to, to follow you on social media, is there anywhere we, where we can direct them to? Yeah, so on Instagram and Twitter, my handle's just TracyHam10. Um, follow me and link to the documentary that Paul was talking about earlier. It's coachthemovie.com. Um, and there's the, the trailer for that. It's right now, it's in film festivals. So it's like not available to the public, but 
Um, I am available if you want to do a screening. What I've been doing in the past, this past year, is um, you know going to different clubs, doing a clinic, and then showing the film, um, and doing a Q and A after. So if you're interested in doing that, you can email me um, or just you know follow me, DM me on the on Instagram. Um, but I also really quickly just want to say that we're starting a new organization that I think is going to help a lot of not just uh, women in soccer, but men that want to support women in soccer. Tracy, you there? We just we lost have, Tracy. We may have just lost Tracy. She might jump back on. Apologies for I wanted to see what organization she was starting. Yeah, if we don't get Tracy back on, we'll definitely get that information out. So Tracy Hampton, um, coachthemovie.com. Um, it's a great oh, Tracy, movie. Oh, there she is. Wow. Tracy, right. I just yeah. want to say I saw your movie and it's great. So yeah. it, uh, it was inspiring. Tracy was talking about your organization. I'll just let you finish up. Oh yeah, um, so it's just a, it's a new organization that is just, yeah, it's collaborative to provide different opportunities and to kind of connect all the women's committees that we know exist nationally that may not have like a main, kind of like a mainstay to all connect what we're doing. And it's just a way to keep us all to, together, share ideas, um, do summits, do conventions, um, and just do whatever we can to enhance the women's game. Brilliant, thank you, Tracy. Tracy Hampton or coachthemovie.com. So thank you, Tracy. Carrie, um, where can attendees and coaches um, get hold of you if they want to reach out? Oh, geez. I sent you guys a slide. Didn't you put it on? I don't even know my own Twitter handles. <laughs> 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 I, I like did the prep that you asked and put my slide on. I don't know. It's like CT underscore SD loyal or something like that. Yeah. Um, Follow us at SD Loyal. If you live in San Diego or Southern Cal, come see a game um, whenever we start our season back up. Um, you can, people can always reach out to me and email me, um, Carrie, or yeah, Carrie T at SDLoyal.com. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me on. Tracy, great to chat with you and definitely want to stay in touch with you offline for sure. Absolutely. Okay. Brilliant. And, and just a um, couple of things there. CT underscore SD Loyal is Carrie's social media handle. I will get that image up for you. And I just had a note from somebody about womeninsoccer.org is the, the uh, venture that Tracy was also talking about. So uh, that's it. The recording will be on the coachingmanual.com. Carrie, Tracy, as always, absolutely fantastic to discuss everything soccer with you. Really appreciate your time um, and hopefully we see you both out on the field sooner rather than later once we get through all of this. So thank you very much attendees. Carrie, Tracy, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, and Dan. we'll see you on the thank next webinar. Thank you. Thank all you. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye.